Well, good morning, everyone. This is uh, uh, John at Central Region Headquarters, and uh, welcome to our continuing series of science sharing webinars. And uh, this one should be particularly interesting. It's the Valentine's Day 2010 snow squall. It was one of these uh, high impact events, which turned out uh, to be a sub advisory event. So it's kind of interesting how you deal with a, a situation like this. So um, I will turn it over to Suzanne to do the uh, introductions uh, from uh, Pleasant Hill today. Okay, well good morning everybody. Um, decided to make our contribution to this great seminar series and uh, have two of the forecasters here that have been working pretty hard on uh, a, a snow squall case that we had back in 2010. Uh, first, uh, Chris Bowman. Chris, go ahead and introduce yourself. Good morning. I'm Chris Bowman. Uh, like Sam said, I'm one of the forecasters here that uh, looked at this event because a um, very interesting case that uh, was pretty high impact for our forecast area. And the uh, second part will be uh, by uh, Matt Dukes, who uh, you know, another one of our journeys here. And uh, I've been working with Matt on a traffic impact study. So uh, we had... Uh, weather and traffic come together on this day, and we'll get to that shortly. Matt, go ahead and introduce yourself. Um, good morning. My name is uh, Matthew Dukes. Um, Suzanne introduced uh, me very eloquently. I'll be going over some of the traffic data here in the second part of the presentation. Uh, really a, a subset of a very large uh, project that we've done in the last year to a year and a half. Um, we'll give an interesting perspective on how this uh, a uh, very localized event did cause uh, some pretty widespread regional impact. Without further ado, I'll go ahead and have uh, Chris uh, start up. And if you have any problems hearing Chris, uh, just let us know. We'll, we'll work with the mic. So go ahead. All right, so um, as, the, as the title implies, this, is, this was a, a snow squall. And I don't think we quite realized it until going back and looking at the data, um, uh, both radar and, and otherwise. And this was just an interesting video I found uh, trying to come up with something about, you know, the, the impacts. And if you could just imagine, this is over Lake Champlain, so obviously uh, not in uh, Missouri or Kansas. Um, <clears throat> but it, it's it's telling because you go from basically unlimited visibility to Fight out conditions uh, very quickly, and I think that's that's what uh, really drove the uh, the impact of this event was uh, the rapid deterioration in, in visibility with this snow squall. So we're going to break this up into uh, several parts. Um, part one, um, just an overview of the uh, the whole. Um, Meteorology of the, the event. We'll do a we'll do a, a brief overview of, of PV because it was a very intense uh, a PV anomaly that uh, induced all this. Uh, just a quick uh, summary of what a snow squall is, and then uh, we'll look at the uh, the actual event, the Valentine's Day vehicular massacre. And I think I can use that term because fortunately there weren't any um, major injuries. Or fatalities. It could have been a lot worse for uh, for the amount of uh, vehicles that were involved in the various uh, pileups across the area. Uh, the second part will be the uh, this is part what Matt will talk about uh, the the impacts, uh, the traffic impacts, and then the third part will uh, discussion on uh, handling the event um, from a product standpoint because it never really met um, any kind of criteria that we would issue uh, any kind of product for, but um, the impact was extremely high impact. We'll just do a, wait till this loads here. Um, I'm just going to do a quick uh, review of uh, isotropic potential vorticity, um, just because that was the driving force uh, behind this, this event. Um, I'm not a mathematician, so this is about the only formula you're going to see. So go ahead. Um, so the, just the definition of uh, uh, potential vorticity, um, it's the vorticity and the, uh, the static stability. 
Um, potential work vorticity is conserved for flow that is frictionless and idiomatic, and uh, potential vorticity will be created or destroyed in the presence of gradients of uh, heating, diabatic heating or cooling. And um, it's a, I find it to be a very powerful uh, tool for investigating uh, many uh, aspects of uh, daily forecasting, the fact that it's conserved variable and includes both mass field and the wind field as an expression. Is everybody on the, the next slide, conservation of PV? Okay. Um, so this, just kind of summarizing, um, if a 2.0 PV unit blob descends from the stratosphere, the static stability will decrease while the absolute vorticity increases. If the flow is frictionless and adiabatic, the value of PV will remain the same. Uh, values uh, must change in unison for this to occur. Uh, therefore, uh, static stability decreases. Uh, if static stability decreases, absolute vorticity must increase. So PV is just the, uh, the product of uh, absolute vorticity on an isotropic surface and static stability. Um, PV represents the absolute surface circulation of an air particle. Uh, hey, Matthew, sorry to interrupt. Could you speak up? Yes, uh, this is Chris. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to speak up. Like, like I said, I'm, I'm a soft talker, which is <laughs> ironic for my size. But um, so PV consists, in contrast to uh, vorticity on an iceberg surface, of two factors, a dynamical element and a thermodynamical element. Um, and I took this uh, from stuff that I learned in, in Wichita, presented by uh, Chris Jacobs there. Uh, because of its properties, PV is uh, the atmosphere is best equivalent to uh, dye in water, um, and therefore can be used to analyze and track weather systems aloft uh, in the frontal disturbances associated with them. So that's my, my quick summary of uh, my quick summary of potential vorticity. Um, so, due to the conservation of, uh, of PV, uh, significant features can be related and tracked in time. Uh, synoptic scale weather systems can be identified and followed in space and time. Uh, in the case of the lowering dynamic tropopause, which is uh, what we're, we're dealing with in this case, uh, the upper PV anomaly can be followed in time and space uh, rather easily on water vapor imagery. And it's also useful in tracing intrusions of stratospheric air deep into the troposphere, uh, which this this case um, is just a really good example of a really deep PV anomaly with a lot of uh, stratospheric air descending deep into the troposphere. Um, so PV acts as a flow tracer uh, in the atmosphere. So um, this is again this is uh, stuff that I. I kind of um, <laughs> copy, I guess, from a, a presentation Chris Jacob did in Wichita, but it, I thought it really uh, was a good example of the usefulness of, of PV. Um, it shows the, uh, the PV units descending into the, into the troposphere. It's basically good enough. So, um, and typically, 1.5 to 2 PV units uh, separates tropospheric air from stratospheric air. Uh, that's referred to as the tropopause. So when you have undul undulations like that, it's, it's you know the dynamic tropopause uh, coming down um, and extending more into the troposphere. Next slide. So hopefully these animations are on here. I I thought I I thought that I had. Uh, done away with them, but uh, apparently not. So the lowering of tropopause is called a tropopause, tropopause undulation, and in this case it's referred to an upper level PV anomaly. Wait till this loads again. All right, um, a tropopause undulation that collapses and extrudes stratospheric air into the tropopause is called a tropopause fold. Until this loads again. 
And tropopause folds can be present without cyclogenesis. However, uh, most major cyclogenesis events over land are associated with uh, uh, tropopause folds. So this is a, an image, if we would look at a constant pressure um, chart, say at 400 millibars, um, you could, on the, on the left, you have the, the bisection of that, um, that field, and on the, on the right, you see the, the PV depiction. And that's, that's useful, but it's, it doesn't really quite uh, show you the, the total usefulness of, of PV. Um, so we'll look at how the dynamic tropopause uh, is assessed and they fill this load again. And when we when we use the 1.5 PV pressure service surface, um, you can really see uh, how three dimensional the um, the tropopause actually is, and how uh, in this case it can descend to close to 500 millibars. Um, so in this case, you have a, a fairly robust uh, system coming on to the to the west coast of the U.S. Okay, so um, the PV anomaly, tropopause undulation, feedback process, um, and und undulation descends in association with uh, upper level convergence of the jet streak. Uh, sinking stratospheric air produces a great deal of warming due to the, the uh, high static stability. Uh, this warm air is easily affected over the surface flow due to a strong uh, flow near jet level. Uh, this warming leads to pressure falls at the surface uh, to an even greater extent than low-level warm convection. Um, as air rises in the vicinity of the low, any adiabatic cooling is overwhelmed by the low-level and upper-level warming. Um, and in this case, it's uh, really fascinating to, to see how intense of a low-level circulation uh, gets formed. Um, also, this uh, will enhance the isotope gradient as it warms up the warm side of the jet streak, uh, leading to an increase in wind shear via the thermal wind. And the stronger the jet streak uh, and greater the ice attack gradient uh, will lead to an enhanced convergence aloft, leading to further extending of the tropopause. OK, so that was my, my really quick overview of, of PV. Um, there's probably people that are better at that in, in regions, but I'll just leave it at that. Um, so now we'll just quickly go over what a snow squall is. Um, a snow squall is a sudden, moderately heavy snowfall with blowing snow and strong, uh, gusty winds at the surface. Uh, they are often referred to as a whiteout and is similar to a blizzard, uh, but is localized in both time and space. Um, and that's really just the epitome of what we were dealing with uh, with this event. Um, and steep low-level lapse rates uh, basically induce what amounts to convection. Um, they're often seen in the Great Lakes region. Um, I know growing up in, in Pittsburgh, uh, any time you get a, a flow over Lake Erie, you'd, you just get these, you know, quick 15-minute snow bursts that would you know, produce maybe half an inch of snow, um, and then it would be sunny again. Um, much more significant snow is obviously closer to the lakes, but uh, it's the same concept. Um, snow mounts may be significant, but they don't have to be uh, to cause major impacts, and that's definitely the case in, in this event. So this might take a little bit of time to, to load. Um, this is a. Okay. Well, what I what I have here. This is a um, live news coverage from uh, one of the news stations here in in town, uh, basically showing um, you know sudden stop in uh, in traffic with pile up uh, behind it, um, and that sudden stop was uh, was basically caused by. The, the intense snow squall that, that moved through uh, with uh, the rapid reduction in visibility. And the video is pretty interesting because there's almost no snow on the ground. It was just a you know, quick 20-minute burst of snow. Drivers ran into it and were forced to reduce their driving speed, and that caused a pileup crashes on many of the area interstates in our forecast area. So unfortunately, the, the video just. What, what weekend was this? Confirmation of what? Valentine's. It was, yeah, it was Valentine's Day. Um, and then. 
basketball game going yeah, on. I, I, think, I think there may have been a basketball game or a tournament uh, downtown at the at the Sprint Center. So there was probably an, an increased load of traffic uh, for, for Sunday afternoon or Sunday right around noon. Let's just go to the slide. Will they be able to see this? Yeah. You can step through for yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, this is, uh, these are images of water vapor with um, PV overlaid in black. Um, and basically, you see the, a really intense PV anomaly coming out of uh, um, Nebraska, uh, basically down the Missouri River. Um, at times, the, it, it can be traced down to about uh, 700 millibars or so uh, based on the model data. And there's even some uh, real-time uh, real data that uh, suggests that that probably was a pretty accurate depiction by the model. So just keep hitting space. Um, so this is a, a, a different uh, form of water vapor. This is from MODIS, um, showing the 20Z surface observations. And you see fairly strong wind gusts as the, uh, the circulation is moving over the area. Um, we got at Topeka 28 knot wind gust, 23 knot uh, wind gust at, uh, at MCI. Um, there were other observations that uh, meshed in there with with those um, anywhere from 25 to 30 knot uh, wind gust um, associated with the, the snow squall that came through. So um, probably dealing with uh, winds on the order of 30 to 35 miles an hour um, within the snowfall. I couple that with uh, you know, just the intensity of the snowfall, you go from good driving conditions to all of a sudden you're not able to see. Next slide. Um, this is a, a visible satellite loop, and maybe Matt can loop through each individual frame. But um, it basically, it, it shows the... Uh, the very in, intense uh, low-level circulation that was induced by the uh, upper-level PV anomaly. Um, it also shows the convective elements um, within the, the, the central part of the uh, um, anomaly owing to the steep low-level lapse rates, which I'll, I'll show later. Um, this is a image that uh, shows lapse rates at various levels. So we have the uh, surface temperature in the upper left, uh, zero to one kilometer lapse rates in the upper right. Um, one of these is actually zero to two kilometer. And I think the zero to three kilometer is on the, uh, the lower right, and zero to two kilometer is on the lower left. Uh, but basically, you've got um, very high low level lapse rates. You're, you're basically convectively unstable uh, through the lowest um, parts of the atmosphere. Uh, so when you have, when you move that uh, um, strong PV anomaly over the, the intense low level lapse rates, you basically are inducing convection. Um, and I don't believe there was any lightning associated with this, but you had a uh, cumuliform cloud uh, develop and even, even the snow squall was almost a, a little MCV uh, that moves through. This is a, um, an analysis sounding, uh, 18Z sounding from uh, the NAM. Um, it shows the really steep lapse rates. And I've drawn in the, the uh, ideal snow growth area. Um, and you can see the, uh, with those steep low level lapse rates, um, you are basically got convection within the uh, snow growth area. Um, Cape, in this case, was on the order of about 25 joules per kilogram. Uh, in, between zero and uh, 0.5 kilometers. So um, it's really interesting to have that through uh, the snow growth layer. Uh, this is a, an aircraft sounding. Um, fortunately, we get these around this time every day at, at MCI. Um, and it shows the, the steep low level lapse rates. And again, I've drawn on the, the snow growth region with the green lines there. Um, so just the observations uh, support the model forecast sounding or the model analysis sounding. Um, yes, wait till this image loads. I think it's a rather large 
static image, so it might take a little bit of time to load. But um, basically, this, this image is a uh, snowfall total for the whole event. And out near uh, Overland Park on the uh, southwest side of the, uh, the metro area, um, three-tenths of an inch of, of snow. Downtown Kansas City had an inch. Um, northwest parts of the metro had, had eight-tenths of an inch. Very low amounts of, of snow for this event. So um, from a criteria standpoint, you know, not really fitting what we would normally issue a, a product for um, for something that's in mid-February when you're well within the winter months and people are kind of used to, to dealing with snow at this point. Um, this is a, a really good radar loop that Matt put together, um, and it, on it it has uh, various uh, multi-car pileups that occurred um, within the snow squall. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's an animation, so it's, it's going to take a little bit of time to load, but um, you can see that the really uh, high impact of this event. Uh, you, the various car pileups on Interstate 70, uh, 435, and I-35. Um, you had a 26 car pileup, a 51 car pileup, a 42 car pileup, and a 30 car pileup, all associated with this snow squall that came through um, with the, the near whiteout conditions and the real short term near blizzard conditions associated with it. Um, yeah, if you, if you go to the MetDAT um, server, I, I have uh, all of the animations on here um, are on, on there that uh, you can go through. Uh, it's much more interesting than looking at slow static images, I guess. So um, that, was, that was my part, the, the meteorology of the event. Now Matt's going to talk about the, uh, the traffic impact. All right, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm going to actually move the microphone a little bit. Uh, so bear with me for just one second. Once again, uh, thanks, Chris, for uh, giving us a good introduction on the event um, and the overall uh, uh, widespread regional uh, size of what this event was. Um, like I said, my name is Matthew Dukes. I'm a general forecaster here at Pleasant Hill. Um, this event, just a little background for me. Uh, for Valentine's Day, unfortunately, I was the one working uh, that evening, so there were no uh, uh, no evening plans uh, planned with my wife. But uh, what was uh, of note when I came to work that day around two o'clock, I was driving through pretty much clear skies. Uh, you know, I could see the sun off in the distance, and all of a sudden, one of these snow squalls was out ahead of me. And basically, I was looking straight to south down the road to zero visibility. Um, and I drove through it, and it only lasted a couple of seconds. But you literally went from, you know, being able to see as far as you could see to basically whiteout conditions um, and being unaware of what was coming down the road towards you uh, on, the, on the road. Uh, heading into work that day, a uh, very busy afternoon. Um, one of the first things you noticed uh, uh, on our situational awareness displays was four TVs turned to massive 50-car uh, pileups. Uh, on our interstate, uh, shutting down three major interstates in the Kansas City metropolitan area. Uh, and in fact, one of our own uh, Weather Service employees, Mike Hudson, uh, his son was involved on uh, one of the massive pileups on Interstate 70 uh, just east of Lawrence. So what we're going to go through uh, on this is uh, from more of a traffic impact perspective. Um, working with the uh, local uh, uh, state DOTs from Kansas, uh, Missouri, Iowa, and Nebraska. We did compile together uh, all incident reports uh, for this event during uh, the Valentine's Day. And there were roughly 435 incidents across the four state area. Uh, the total num number of vehicles involved, right around 1,997. Uh, injury totals, surprisingly, given the amount of, of uh, accidents involved, were 
somewhat low, uh, to put it in perspective, 122 injuries in Kansas, 47 in Iowa, and 69 in Missouri. Unfortunately, Nebraska, no known information uh, from the DOC as far as injuries. Uh, however, through media reports uh, and such things, we were aware of one death uh, that occurred on a rollover accident uh, west of Omaha on I-80. Uh, the biggest impact, though, was uh, at least five major interstates shut down for six or more hours, including uh, Interstate 2980. Uh, and locally, the, the biggest impact was on Interstate 70, uh, just west of Kansas City, uh, the the uh, accident actually uh, took place on a bridge, which made uh, much uh, things much more difficult to clear off uh, just from a logistics standpoint of, of getting vehicles into the area to remove the damaged vehicles. Uh, this is a map of the Kansas City metro uh, uh, Politan area and the traffic uh, incidents uh, for that day. This image is a little bit slow to load. Uh, the red squares indicate the uh, areas where the accident count were the highest. Uh, the accident uh, west, on, west of Kansas City, I-70, was 51 vehicles. There were two uh, multi-pile, uh, multi-car pileups, one on uh, Interstate 435 near the Kansas River, almost 30 vehicles there, and a second, uh, or a third pileup uh, in Overland Park on Interstate 35, uh, somewhere around 20 vehicles uh, included in that pileup. The image is just a couple of the uh, screen captures that we could get off of our local uh, traffic cams of the incident. The one in the uh, bottom uh, right-hand side of the screen is the major pileup on Interstate 70. You can see all the traffic accidents were actually on uh, uh, the eastbound lanes going into Kansas City. No impact on the westbound lanes. However, uh, uh, further, uh, further west there was an accident that did end up leading to that interstate being shut down as well. That road was closed for over 12 hours uh, just because of the massive area of debris that had to be cleaned up. This uh, event did pique um, quite a bit of interest in me because we do know that, uh, that uh, the weather events uh, do not always follow the rules when it comes to the traffic around the metro. And I think what we're finding across many of our metros in the region is we're just beginning to uh, grasp on to uh, uh, an idea as far as you know what those impacts are going to be. We're fortunate here in Kansas City. We do have what's called the Kansas City Scout Network, um, which is gradually developing. It's, it's young in its uh, young in its age. It's only maybe 10 years old, um, but it's a network of traffic sensors, speed data. Uh, volume data. They also run camera networks and other such things across the area. Um, but we have a combination of, of multiple ASOS uh, systems across the metro as well as the uh, uh, RWIS stations and meson other mezzanine stations where we can collect the, the volume of data. So this impact, this incident was kind of the starting point for what we've developed into a more comprehensive uh, study between not only ourselves, but working in tandem with the Kansas City Scout Network uh, so that we can uh, try to get a better impact not only for us, but uh, for their needs as far as how they can help uh, prevent some of these major pileups uh, from happening in the future. The images you're going to see here in a few minutes are just kind of a broad uh, uh, overview of uh, what the Kansas City Scout Network is. Um, the bottom uh, right image is uh, the variation of sensors that are deployed across the city. Right now, the sensors are deployed mainly in the southern half of the metro. However, there are uh, uh, more sensors being added to the north side of the metro because we do have an extended uh, interstate network uh, to the north of Kansas City, uh, Interstate 29 and 35, both head up one towards Omaha and one towards Des Moines. Um, secondly, uh, for situational awareness purposes, there's a wide array of uh, live streaming video and live uh, uh, stationary image or, or standby images across much of the metro. So we could, uh, even in real time, get a pretty good image as far as what was happening out on the roads uh, when this event happened. So just going through a little bit of what we've uh, done with this uh, uh, study, it's such a comprehensive amount of data that we were looking at. 
we wanted to try to pick several locations across the metro uh, and try to, when I say locations, I'm talking about road sensors. Um, sensors at various points in the metro where the traffic may volume may vary. We're trying to look at some of the, the higher impact feeder roads into the metro, uh, the interstate systems, where we can typically have a lot of congestion and a lot of accident problems throughout um, the past weather events. Um, and we're going to take this data, uh, which is sampled in five-minute intervals, and try to correlate those sensors with some of our ASOS and road weather systems and mesonets uh, in the area to come up with, is there a correlation between traffic data, is traffic responding to uh, the weather conditions that are occurring at that time? This, this data that we're going to see today is actually a subset of about uh, six different types of weather we're looking at, from flash flooding to severe weather to uh, you know, hail storms to snowstorms to even freezing drizzle. Um, and it's very preliminary at the, uh, uh, at the most just because of, of the large data, data set that we're looking at. The sample locations uh, that you'll see here in a, a minute uh, located Within the available network, we tried to grab a sample of north and south running interstates as well as east and west running interstates because, as we know, uh, you can also have uh, uh, traffic impacts from visibility, but wind and even wind direction uh, can be more critical, especially when you get to uh, elements such as snow, uh, which could reduce the visibilities uh, and uh, you know, cause that crucial crosswind component. The image on the left shows our available uh, sensors, at least, that we use, or observation points that we use for this study. Little uh, airport uh, icons here uh, are our ASOS stations. One uh, in the far northwest corner is uh, Kansas City International. Fortunately for this event, Kansas City International didn't play a huge role. Uh, most of the precipitation, uh, as well as our traffic sensors, just aren't located up there at this point. Um, so maybe in the future, we can look at that site. The main impact uh, observation sites were downtown, right at the center of the city, as well as some points on the southwest side of the city uh, and uh, one point on the southeast side of the city. Other symbols there, uh, you'll see two there right about in the middle of uh, Kansas City, uh, your typical Google-looking icons. Those are our uh, road weather information uh, sensors. And from there, we can those sensors, we can look at pavement data other things like that, pavement temperature. Just a brief overview on our traffic terms. We're going to look at three things today. Vehicle speed, uh, which in this study is defined by the average speed of vehicle traffic at the sensor point. Our volume, the number of vehicles crossing that sensor point uh, throughout a timed interval, in this case five minutes. Lane occupancy, always a tricky, uh, tricky thing to define. Most studies refer to it as, uh, or compare it to a level of congestion, a level of density, basically the amount of vehicles occupying uh, between sensors in that given time. The first things here, we didn't really get a great uh, shot at the radar imagery a little bit earlier, so we've had a couple static images here. And these timelines will be important to remember as we look at the traffic graph. Uh, Right around 10.30 in the morning, we did start to see the initial uh, convective cell development uh, begin to move from the west to the east across portions of uh, Kansas City. As we move towards uh, right around 2 p.m., uh, this was right around the peak heating of the day. We did have a little bit of sunshine pop out ahead of this uh, uh, upper level low. Uh, so you did see kind of the, um, they almost look like little uh, Boeing segments as they move through the the metro, uh, and in behind this, or in these confined areas of higher reflectivity, was where we were seeing the whiteout conditions. Uh, the visibility is going from 10 statute miles to as, as minimal as uh, 200 feet, um, was what some of the reports were on the interstates that we were seeing uh, at that time. Going through the event a little bit later, right around uh, 1,500 hours or 3 p.m. that afternoon, uh, the sun is starting to set, so we're starting to lose some of that convective nature to the storms. Uh, and, but, however, we were begin, beginning to see the very uh, compact but widespread area of uh, uh, deprivation band snow on the backside. Very, 
intense band, but uh, um, you're going to see in a minute just how low the visibility has dropped. And this is the snow band that actually produced the snow accumulations from you know a trace to maybe an inch, inch and a half, uh, just because the upper low was moving so quickly. Uh, as it moved across the area, your accumulations just weren't uh, any higher in the area. So as we move through, forward through the slides, just remember these four points of interest, and I'll make a note of them as we begin to look at the data. So what we're going to see here is the first uh, point of the study, which is I-635 I in Shawnee Drive. This is, uh, when looking at the overall traffic uh, volume uh, scheme of things, this is one of the lower feeder routes heading into or towards the downtown Kansas City area. It actually uh, feeds into the western portions of Kansas City, Kansas, uh, from which you could take I-70 into downtown. I-35 is the most direct route into the Kansas City metro, and that will be a, a, the second point that we're going to be looking at in a, in a brief minute. We're comparing this site to data which is located at the downtown airport. This is about, oh, I said in this slide, five miles northeast. It's really mainly more like uh, eight to ten miles northeast. Uh, so what we're going to see here, um, giving you a brief overview, other than a lot of squiggly lines, which, which is really what it does look like. Um, the green line on the top here represents the average vehicle speed, or the speed over the three lanes of traffic on uh, Interstate 635 uh, average together. The blue line is uh, what we consider our traffic volume, um, and the red line is the vehicle or the lane occupancy over those lanes. Blue line at the bottom is our visibility. Uh, so looking back or remembering back at those, those four radar images, I've denoted here on the black lines, uh, the first two black lines are the main time period where we were seeing the convective snow squall uh, movement across the city. Uh, and the third line here is basically the beginning of the more consistent, lower visibility uh, uh, deformation band snow as it moved across the city. So within the gap of the first two lines, we do notice in the visibilities, you see a very jumpy uh, visibility profile at downtown, likely indicating uh, just how scattered in nature or how infrequent these uh, snow squalls were as they move through. From a traffic perspective, not a lot of impact uh, here on the interstate as we uh, started the uh, event out. However, you do see the speed reduction from right around on average 68 miles per hour, actually a little bit above the speed limit there, um, dropping down to all the way to 52 miles per hour on average. Uh, the lowest lane in this uh, uh, on this section of the interstate dropped down to, you know, on average, 30 miles per hour. We do notice that the, uh, the traffic volume does increase, but most of all, you see that the lane occupancy is beginning to supersede uh, the volume. So when you see this happen, you're starting to indicate uh, congestion on those roadways. It all kind of coordinates with itself. You know, if you think about it, speed reduction, traffic congestion goes up, um, those kind of things. Now, if you move forward in time, um, you do begin to see the visibilities increase between right around oh, 1,400 hours to right around 1,600 hours. And this is uh, kind of in that lull between uh, the convective activities moving off to the southeast and you're waiting for the more concentrated band of snow uh, moving into the area. As a result, you did see the speed uh, increased, relatively speaking. Your congestion loosened up, uh, and your volume, you know, at that peak of the day started to begin to decrease. But what's interesting is once you get towards 16 to 1700 hour time range, or 5 p.m., you get that more concentrated snow band moving in, and those visibilities and speeds are greatly reduced, once again, even further. Uh, you know, it's hard to say, looking at this graph, is, is the visibility a direct correlation of, uh, of uh, those speed reductions, uh, especially with the snow, snow clusters, convective snow squalls? It could be. Um, you could start having the accidents begin to pile up, and that could uh, start to cause that, uh, that overall reduction. A more substantial note is there was a pretty considerable lag in the reduction of the visibilities the second go-around 
uh, between when the speed and the congestion actually began to impact uh, uh, portions of, uh, uh, of the interstate uh, traffic. One last thing before we move on to the next slide. Uh, right away in the beginning of the uh, uh, visibility chart, you do see relatively low visibilities during the overnight hours. This actually happened to be uh, somewhat of a reduced fog event uh, early in the morning. The winds were very light. Uh, you had fog. However, I'm hiding. Unfortunately, I hid the uh, the, the speed data, uh, but there really was no uh, reduction in visibility or reduction in speed uh, due to the, those reduced visibility. So, is that uh, can you infer that really fog? doesn't have a lot of impact unless there's an accident on our roadways, you know, perhaps, uh, but perhaps we just don't even know yet. We're going to take a quick look at the uh, wind speeds here. Um, throughout the day, winds are consistently running right around 15, uh, uh, 15 knots throughout the day, so very gusty winds, uh, as Chris alluded to earlier. During the height of the event, really not much of a wind shift. Um, the stronger winds started to increase you know, after some of those snow, uh, uh, snow squalls moved through and, and uh, uh, remained pretty much consistent. You now, unfortunately, due to location of, of the, the observation data that we're using here being about 10 miles east, we don't have an available uh, mesonet site right at that uh, uh, sensor data, so perhaps there could have been a localized higher wind gust um, which could have impacted things, or maybe just the resolution of uh, the sampling perhaps missed, uh, 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 missed that wind gust as it moved through. Taking a quick uh, glance at uh, individual lane speeds and then uh, taking a glance at the wind direction, once again, another tricky thing to correlate um, quantitatively. Uh, qualitatively, we did see fairly pronounced wind shift from the southwest to the west to southwest uh, to the more northwesterly uh, component uh, just before the reduction of speed on Interstate 635. Uh, so perhaps you can attribute the crosswind component, uh, remembering that this is a north-south oriented uh, roadway that maybe as the wind began to shift, there was enough of a visibility reduction and enough of a crosswind component that it caused some ice to build up on the roads, and you know those brief uh, visibility reductions did cause the reduction in, in speed volume or speed and uh, uh, increase in congestion. Later on in the day, little to no wind shift. Uh, most likely, this has no impact on uh, on those uh, uh, speed reductions, other than the visibility uh, themselves and the road conditions themselves deteriorating. Second point of interest, a little bit further south, uh, on the Interstate 35 system, a much higher traffic speed uh, and traffic volume, because it is one of the primary feeder routes uh, from the southwest, from Wichita on into Kansas City. And it also serves as a feeder point from uh, Interstate 470, which uh, is one of the primary routes on the southern uh, half of the metro. This site is compared to a location that's running around 10 miles due south uh, of the uh, sensor data. At I-35 and 69, much similar to what we saw at 635, you did see those periodic reductions in visibility. Um, of note, you did see right around 1,400 hours visibilities to right around uh, uh, zero uh, at the Johnson County Airport or directly due south of uh, this sensor point. Overall speed reduction, once again, dropped nearly 20 miles per hour on average. You did see uh, a rebound, um, like the other chart. Uh, as conditions improved, visibilities improved, uh, congestion decreased, speeds went back to right around normal. Um, and then, uh, uh, once again, the reduction in visibility, speed, um, and the overall just uh, lowering volume trend of traffic throughout the afternoon. Part of this could be on hand of uh, lower, you know, lower volume of tra traffic giving if, given at the Sunday evening. Uh, at this point, uh, people are already aware of the roads uh, being messy from the media reports of the multiple accidents. Uh, 
And at some degree, some of the interstates in the area were still closed, so some of the feeder traffic onto this interstate could be lower as well. Looking at individual speed lane data, the blue line here being the further uh, left lane, consider that being your fast lane. Um, the green lane here being your slow lane. Uh, you did see at max your speed on the fast lane was running right around 65 miles an hour. Uh, and then on the slow lane, right around 30 miles an hour. Uh, similar things, uh, really just, like I said, you're seeing general reductions in visibility across the, uh, that area. A little more pronounced wind shift here, uh, begin to looking at this Johnson County Airport. Uh, you did see right around at the same point of the drop in vehicle speed uh, and increase in volume, you saw a shift from the west all the way around almost to due north. So qualitatively, this could have an impact. Once again, this is a somewhat north to south running traffic lane. And again, in the afternoon, late afternoon and evening, little to no wind shift once the upper level low pass by. You're pretty much looking at the straight northwest to northerly wind. We did throw in a couple road uh, weather sensor data points uh, nearby to these two sensor locations. The one, the image you're seeing on the top is uh, located up uh, on Interstate 635 or very uh, very near it. Uh, the, the location to the sensor data on the bottom half of the screen is located uh, more closely related to the I-35 point. This is three days' worth of data, the day before uh, Valentine's Day and the day after Valentine's Day, just so you can have a perspective of what typical pavement temperatures are like um, given the weather conditions. Now, weather conditions before the event were relatively warm that uh, day. We had strong uh, warm air moving into the area. Your temperatures were in the 40s, uh, lower upper 30s to lower 40s, resulting with sunny skies, you would expect your pavement temperatures to climb uh, slightly warmer than your average surface temperature up near 50. What's interesting of note during the day on Valentine's Day is just the overall, uh, I won't say smooth uh, appearance of the pavement temperatures, uh, but perhaps there was a little bit of response once you started to see some of these uh, snow bands move through. at. Uh, 1,200 hours, which is right around noon, as they're moving into that peak of the event, you start to see a choppy pavement temperature. So you're starting to see may perhaps some of that snow cover uh, periodically uh, moving through that through that road sensor. Uh, you're also starting to see some of uh, the traffic. Uh, the traffic at this point could be packing down some of that snow and making uh, those temperatures a little bit lower. As you move later into the afternoon hours, when you get the more intense snowfall, the more widespread snowfall, with the higher likelihood of, of, of putting snowpack on those roads, you're seeing those pavement temperatures, which are circled here, uh, drop fairly steadily uh, as we move into the uh, late afternoon and evening hours. The next day, uh, we saw on the 15th pretty typical conditions. You had sunny skies. Your roads were actually uh, cleared off by that point. So you just so you pretty much see you know, kind of the comparison of of the, the of day with pavement temperatures with weather and a day with no uh, no temperature no no impacts to those uh, to those road conditions. So much uh, different uh, charts and comparison. The last site here we'll look is is up on the north uh, or the east side of the metro on I seventy. And we chose this point point just for kind of a uh, comparison of a traffic point which had somewhat little to no impact from these these little snow squalls as they moved through. Uh, it was just on the northern and the, the eastern fringe of this activity. Uh, I-70, if you're not aware of, the, the road is one of the primary roads from Kansas City to St. Louis. Uh, usually pretty high volume uh, at all times of the day other than uh, during the overnight hours. Uh, this uh, sample just this station, just because of the lack of data within the, the local area, is being compared to Kansas City Downtown Airport, about eight miles west of the location. 
what you're going to see here, um, given the uh, northeast or northwest to southeast moving orientation of the upper low, uh, the snow squall did impact the downtown airport, which is why you're seeing the, the varied visibility. But further east, just on the cusp uh, of the snow squalls, you didn't most likely have the reduction in visibility. And thus, you're seeing in traffic data, at least the speed, volume, and occupancy, a fairly normal, a fairly typical uh, Sunday afternoon. Uh, vehicle counts were roughly around 200 to 250 vehicles moving through these sensors uh, per five-minute intervals. Uh, the biggest impact on I-70 happened right around uh, the 5 p.m. hour when you started to get that more widespread uh, light snow and, and uh, brief uh, accumulating snow across the area. That's when you did begin to see congestion rapidly increase. The speed dropped at you know, 20 to 20 or so miles per hour, uh, and the visibilities were hovering right around a mile or less uh, for about uh, three to uh, four hours in, in nature. Uh, as you can see through the night, you know, obviously, once your uh, visibilities did improve, your your snow moved through the area. Your speed volume did come, your speed did come up. However, just given the time of the day, you have your normal uh, give it uh, call it a normal diurnal trend in traffic. Your volumes decrease, your occupancy decreases. So basically, the interstate is handling um, the traffic and the volume despite having the snowfall. So perhaps, like I said, in this case, your visibility did have a direct correlation to those reductions. Once again, looking at wind speed, really no correlation that we can see here. There were no sudden increases in wind uh, throughout the daytime and, and the evening hours. So this is likely not having a huge impact. Similar to uh, wind direction here, during the you know afternoon hours, no considerable uh, impact from those snow squalls. You do see the downtown data, the, the wind change in direction again. Uh, but during that evening, late afternoon, evening reduction and increase in congestion, no really noticeable or discernible uh, wind shift, uh, despite given this is an east to west running route, um, one would consider perhaps the more uh, northwesterly flow to have a little bit more of an impact given the, the cross uh, uh, the crosswind nature of the precipitation, but like I said, it's just uh, too, un too uncertain to make that correlation at this uh, point in time. So just kind of recap things here without going uh, too much uh, uh, further. Over the course of the 24 hours, we did see this compact, uh, very powerful upper level of PV anomaly move across the area. This caused nearly 1,000 accidents in four states and numerous multi-vehicle crashes. Looking at just the, tra the traffic data and the impact on the traffic data, qualitatively, yeah, you could say weather did have an impact. Visibility uh, reductions uh, most likely led to uh, decreases in speed and increases in uh, congestion across the interstate. There's, it's just too soon to quantitatively have uh, uh, any sort of idea if there's a direct timing or uh, directional uh, component of the wind relationship uh, that would uh, indicate a more direct uh, impact to those roads. So like I said, this whole thing needs more investigation, and that's what this uh, a large uh, scale project that we're working on is, is uh, going to be moving forward with. Uh, we do have some limitations, obviously. Uh, with the data sampling of our observations near these traffic sensor locations. There are mesonet sites in the area and road weather information sites uh, within the area that uh, we'll begin to start looking at. Like I said, the large database of events is, is a, it's substantial. Um, we did have a college student at one point working on um, this over the last summer. Unfortunately, college students have to go back to college, so we're stuck with trying to fit uh, uh, analyzing a lot of this data into our normal uh, operation schedule, which, as we all know, can be pretty pretty difficult. Uh, so like I said, over the next uh, year, hopefully we'll be able to uh, uh, come up with some more conclusions and more direct correlations. We would like to do a, a regression analysis uh, as some 
similar studies in the past have started to do. Like I said, the Kansas City metro system is, is uh, much like other metro systems. So we're hoping if we can find some correlations, they could provide relevance to, uh, to other NWS offices in the region uh, just because of the wide impacts of, of weather on our traffic system. This brings us to kind of a uh, discussion period, um, if we have time here. Uh, this is one of those things that if you look at our criteria as a weather service, with a very low snowfall total, half an inch, dusting in some locations, maybe an inch in our, our localized metro, how do we approach that? It doesn't really fit into our, our winter weather advisory criteria here as an office, and it doesn't uh, fall into a warning criteria. Um, so looking at it from the other perspective, you all, you wouldn't issue uh, uh, you know, multi-hour uh, warnings uh, for this kind of event. So does a product like the special weather statement, uh, specific wording uh, to such of a snow squall, where it's not as, uh, you know, not as long impact as, a, as an advisory or a warning would be, uh, but would be a product that would be more short term, maybe uh, 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 short fuse that would catch the attention of the media, catch the attention of, of uh, the public. Uh, I know in our local metro, our SPS statements do go over oh, the Weather Channel, and our media does grasp onto those things um, more than a product such as a short-term forecast. Um, so I guess the open discussion is, is how do we approach this? Would a um, special weather statement be the appropriate thing, or um, is a winter weather advisory the appropriate thing? Uh, you know, on our office as a whole, we've begun to take the approach of uh, using special weather statements uh, for these types of events because they're short term in nature and uh, we want to grab the public's attention without issuing uh, you know this uh, short term product or more long term visibility products such as a, a winter weather advisory so with that we kind of wrap up our part of uh, the discussion uh, from a traffic and an overall event uh, impact and we'll open it up to questions and maybe even a, a discussion as far as uh, um, our approach to the to this system and uh, uh, what other offices might consider doing uh, for this system. Well, thank you very much. And if there's any questions, uh, the lines are open. Yes, this is Ron here in St. Louis. Hi, Ron. And uh, a couple of things. With these little snowman structures, you say there are amounts only about an inch, maybe half an inch at most. Are these guys, are these banded structures, I guess, they're, not move, they're moving pretty good speed? Or, I mean, I'm surprised they're not producing maybe a couple of inches or two, three inches because I was raised in northern Indiana, <coughs> and the snowband structures would be pretty well, well I guess, quasi stationary in nature, and I would see six, seven, eight inches of snowfall. So in this situation, these things must be moving at pretty decent speed, I gather. That's why they're only producing only up an inch at most, a half an inch. Yet they're really causing visibility to drop down quite a bit. And the width of the bands must not be that wide, but maybe a half mile wide, quarter mile. I'm, I'm just trying to get a more idea of what's going on yeah, here. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, the, the over, upper level low itself, uh, to put it into the regional perspective, it went from uh, North Dakota all the way to uh, uh, well, into the boot heel of Missouri in about 12 to 15 hours. So you can just kind of do the calculations in your head just how fast things are moving. Um, the snow squalls themselves move through the area in about a two to three hour time frame. Uh, and, and as I said at the beginning, when I was driving to work, they were so narrow in nature that you were mainly looking at uh, maybe a quarter, quarter well, Put it this way, mainly a mile, maybe mile wide, maybe two miles at most, and they were moving um, at a very reasonable clip uh, eastward. So you really just didn't have much more accumulation other than uh, a dusting to a trace, uh, or a dusting to a few tenths of an inch as, as they moved through. Uh, and that's why perhaps that snow band on the back side of the storm didn't produce you know, those five to six inches of snow uh, was because of the speed of the 
Uh, TV anomaly itself was just moving so fast that the visibility reductions with that band were only two to three hours at most. So uh, despite having some pretty good snow clips, uh, you know, the accumulations were, were so light. Uh, and the winds, the winds themselves were, were still sustained at like 25 knots. So the snow was blowing around. Uh, you didn't really have ideal measurement situations going on. So everything in general is just moving very fast through, through the metro itself. Yeah, I appreciate the information. That's um, I'm, I'm just thinking of the cases I can recall when I was back. In, this I, this is a long time ago. I'm sorry, back in high school, back in the '70s, <laughs> early '70s, late '60s, and I, I remember very vividly, very well, basically, you know, these band instructions. But they would fall in the same location. I mean, and we had what's called the short parallel band structures that went through and produced 18 inches of snowfall uh, over maybe a period of six uh, six hours, something like that. But some like these guys that just keep on moving, and I guess you get multiple bands like this coming through, and yet the only deposit, even though the visibility is down to zero or less than a quarter mile, you still just get, like you said, only about maybe half an inch of snow, and that's kind of interesting that, uh, again, these things are moving at a pretty good clip, basically. So I appreciate your comments very much. Ron, this is uh, Chris. Uh, just to expand on what you said, I mean, um, <clears throat> like effect, you know, you have, nearly uh, parallel winds throughout the column of the atmosphere <coughs> that helps keep that band pretty stationary. Um, this was entirely different where you, you actually had a little bit of uh, a wind shear and you actually had almost like a, a winter squall line. It was a, you know, it was a line, you know, forward propagating line of snow. So a, a different mechanism. And each individual area um, where those accidents occurred was only in within a snow or uh, seeing snow for maybe 20 minutes to half an hour because of the narrowness of the, of the band or the squall line, uh, as well as the, uh, the speed at which it was moving. So uh, there just wasn't a whole lot of time to accumulate snow. And um, in, in the video you can that shows the, uh, the news coverage of it, um, you go and look at it. There, there's actually no snow on the on the highway. It's, it's clear with um, just the, the temporary. Uh, burst of snow, basically, um, as the squall moves through. So. Oh, very good. Yeah, thanks very much. I appreciate the comments. This is very interesting. Yeah, I appreciate the comments very much. Hi, this is Gina Green Bay. I have a couple comments and a question. Yep. Um, we had a, a remarkably similar event back in November of 08, and, and the difference in, in the, the heights event that we had was there were, you know, intense snow squalls that occurred during the late afternoon, reducing visibility, but the major traffic impact was actually just after sunset where the uh, light snow melted uh, just briefly and then uh, refroze. We had numerous accidents just after sunset um, with that, and we weren't aware of the traffic impacts until maybe a, a couple hours after, and we just struggled with, you know, how to handle an event like that. Uh, we decided SPS was the way to go. And then uh, on a related note, this, this past uh, month or so, we had a, an event where we had, like, freezing fog. Um, we had uh, very icy roads developed uh, overnight uh, with the favorable conditions. And, again, we, we struggled with the product issue there. And, again, we thought maybe the SPS was the way to go. Um, and one of the things we considered was using the wording of a, of a traveler's alert, sort of in the SPS, kind of as a as a eye-opening headline to – to uh, alert um, our, our customers. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on, on, on you know, the product itself and, and, and issuing these type of products where the impact is still occurring after the snow squalls uh, are over and that type of thing. So any comments would be appreciated. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, well, you can mean both. I mean, we, we're kind of trending, and this is Suzanne, we're trending that direction. We've actually done a lot of reworking of our SPS template to kind of take an account for these type of events. Um, and uh, it just we added, we haven't had any winter weather this year, unfortunately. But I think more and more, uh, as Matt stated um, earlier, I think just given the attention the SPS um, has, and uh, we've decided to go that route for now. Um, you know, like I said, we haven't been able to really test that out to see, you know, what the customer feedback is and, you know, you know 
know, that's something we have to be uh, attentive to, too, is, is if, you know, the media um, and the emergency managers, et cetera, are basically that's the device they would rather have us use for these, uh, these smaller scale events like this. So, I mean, that's, I, I, and we, we specifically put in instances like you've experienced up there in our template for black ice, um, freezing fog situations, because I think everybody's experienced, you know, most everybody has experienced these types of events in the, win in the winter time, and, and every time it's like, well, you're on a quandary, how do you, how do you cover these types of events? So we just made a decision collectively uh, to use this as our vehicle. So, I mean, this is how, how we're approaching it. Um, yeah, and I will, I will add to this. Uh, from a, the forecaster perspective here, um, yeah, this was a perfect, perfect event to kind of get caught, I won't say behind the eight ball on it, um, but we weren't expecting to have these kind of impacts. And uh, you know, we were expecting some convective uh, you know, developments, uh, these snow squalls, and you know, we were expecting a little bit of light snow. Uh, we weren't expecting half an inch of snow to produce, uh, in, you know, shut down, basically shut down our entire metro. Um, you know, and that, that's where you go, well, could you have issued a winter weather advisory? Well, the thing is, is, uh, yeah, perhaps you could have, but, uh, you know, an advisory for, a, for an hour or less uh, maybe doesn't do a lot of good. But we could see this starting to move down from, Omaha, and you could start to see the development, and maybe that's you know, on the similar perspective as a severe thunderstorm warning or tornado warning. The SPF, at least in this metro, uh, seems to have grabbed traction with our media, and I know our weather channel. The weather channel here scrolls it across, um, you know, with NWS chat and those kind of things. It grabs that more visibility than short-term forecast, which really, uh, right now, has no visibility from a web page perspective to media and uh, other perspectives. So, you know, from this, from our standpoint, you know, I'm trying to remember back from the event itself, and, and uh, I know through, as it moved through Omaha, there was the gradual tacking on of, of advisories as the thing moved southeast. Now, whether or not that gave a heads up before it was too late, and just like in your office, a lot of times you don't find out about the impacts uh, until or you don't find out really what's happening until you find out the impacts on the news, you know, half an hour to an hour later. So uh, and that's why we're kind of doing this traffic study to just correlate that out. So I was just going to add to kind of tack on to what Matthew and Jeannie said, that biggest problem in stuff like this is sometimes even knowing you have to do anything. In, in Gene's case, you know, precip's over and the roads road start to freeze. We right. had a similar case here in St. Louis where we had freezing drizzle working across the area. All night long we called out to the west, no problems, no problems, no problems. Got to St. Louis just at rush hour, it turned into a skating rink. Yeah, I think sometimes... Absolute skating rink. So, so, you know, sometimes the biggest thing is, do you need to even do anything? Knowing, knowing that you have to do something, I guess, is, is, the, is the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, I guess we kind of took the, an analogy of severe weather. I mean, we know in any type of severe weather, when we have thunderstorm activity, that, you know, the two out of three rule, it looks like it's bad. You know, you know conceptually, if radar shows it could be bad, then you issue. I mean, so I, th I guess. Well, I think and, that's, and I, Suzanne, I think that's good. I, my concern for winter weather is, is zero lead time good enough? Because it takes road crews well, yeah, one to two hours here in the St. Louis metro area to get going. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I know. Yeah, I, I, I'm not saying I have an answer. I'm just saying that's one of the biggest problems. You know, advance notice is the key to all this. Stuff, you know, as Matthew was saying, you find out an hour after the fact, well, you, you know, you're going to help people that haven't taken off yet, but those that are stuck in it are, uh, you know, I'm just yeah. saying. Yeah, well. Like always, we do what we can, I guess. And I mean, this is I, Jake from the Des Moines office. If I could sneak in a comment, sure. All right. Um, first of all, I thought it was a great presentation, uh, but I was just thinking, sort of piggybacking off what you said, is that 
how about the idea of issuing a blizzard watch? Because um, you have the cold air advection, you have the strong winds, and you have the elevated instability, and you have the potential for snow squalls. And if you put a blizzard watch out, because I was just looking at a few soundings uh, from like 14 or from 0Z and 12Z on the previous day, and they do kind of indicate that potential. So if you have the watch out, I think that could really help in the planning purposes, and that would have the biggest impact because clearly this was a very high-impact event. So that's um, sort of my take on that. And Yeah, I'll, if I can quick respond to that. Um, the problem is here is if you... You know, from our perspective, if we were to issue a blizzard watch, yeah, from, you know, from having what's happened with the high winds, very low visibilities, um, yeah, that meets that kind of idea. The problem is here is uh, if we would do that, uh, you know, there may be a coup on our, our media and uh, everything else trying to uh, say what are we doing. Uh, it may be just over. It's like you don't want to say it's going to be overkill, but it may be. Uh, a little bit too much, and then how do you justify when an actual blizzard uh, uh, reaches the area? Uh, it's all I, it's, it's all ideas. So uh, there's no perfect way of, of handling these kind of cases. Fair enough. I have one more quick question, if you don't mind. Hey, go ahead. Um, did the snow squalls? Unfortunately, first of all, we weren't able to get any west data for this case, so maybe. Uh, if we could, if you could send over some West data, that'd be greatly appreciated. Sure. Um, did the snow squalls form where there was a snowpack? I tried to look from the visible satellite, and it seemed like once they got to where there was bare ground, they really took off. Is that true, or was I miss, miss seeing it? Um, I think that's, that's probably a, a pretty good uh, observation. There wasn't any snowpack um, here, um, and, and the event moved through uh, pretty close to peak heating. Um, and like the, the, the uh, satellite animation shows you know, some clearing, and then you have the convective clouds, um, and then everything sweeps through as the uh, upper PV anomaly moves through. So um, you know, the lack of snow cover, that maybe enhanced the, uh, the surface temperatures a bit, leading to a bit more uh, low-level instability. Uh, so that, yeah, maybe that, that did have a little bit of uh, an effect on the overall intensity. All right, thanks. And yeah, I really appreciate that presentation. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Well, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, taking the time to do this. And it was uh, definitely a different way of uh, looking at things that we Sometimes we've all run into this and trying to decide what to do, and uh, it was a great presentation. Thank you. And thanks, John. Like I said, if, if folks want to view the uh, videos and some of the, the animated stuff that we didn't get to show here at the presentation, uh, everything is loaded up on the MedDat uh, uh, folder. Um, I think there's about five different uh, animations there. And I'll have this recording on there.